Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, hello and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Manush Bhakti, the curator and project coordinator of the Regional Science Center and Planetarium Kodikor. Uh, welcome to our program first hand in conversation with uh, Professor Chandrima Shaha, President uh, Indian National Science Academy and uh, Professor of Eminence uh, uh, Indian Institute of Immunology. Now, we started this series uh, after the uh, corona pandemic broke out in our country and uh, we wanted to understand the situation uh, by talking firsthand to experts uh, of the field. And we wanted to have an in-depth study of what is happening and uh, where it can lead to. So, we talked to all the presidents, uh, fortunately, uh, all the presidents uh, of the science academies of our country. Earlier we had with us uh, uh, Professor G. Padmanavan, uh, the president Nasi, then we uh, had uh, uh, Professor Parthapratim Majumdar, and uh, today uh, we have Professor Chandrima Shaha. She is one of the most prominent biologists and immunologists of our country, who has become the first woman president of INSA, Indian National Science Academy, in the first 85 years of its history. Uh, but she has more dimensions to her prowess, and uh, I have a, a young age memory of uh, that. Uh, probably those of uh, you who are of my age can remember that she was also a cricket commentator and the first uh, woman cricket commentator of uh, All India Radio. Not only that, more to it, uh, she was also the vice captain of the first uh, women cricket team of West Bengal. But beyond all these things, uh, Professor Shah graduated uh, with a master's degree from the University of Calcutta and completed her doctoral research from the Indian Institute of Chemical Biology. Uh, for her postdoctoral work, she went to the University of Kansas Medical Center. Later on, she was at the Population Council, New York City. And finally, she joined the National Institute of Immunology in New Delhi as a scientist where she became the director later on. Uh, when we were talking today, we all know that the total number of novel corona infections in India has grown to 2.57 lakhs and the fatality is now more than 7,000. No doubt we need to understand the disease to combat and contain it. So we wish to listen to Professor Sa on programmed cell death, immunity and infection. We all see that all these ideas are inextricably entwined and of critical importance to deal with the SARS-CoV-2, which we commonly call the novel coronavirus. Madam, please take over for your opening remarks and which after which we can go for the conversation. Thank you, Madam, for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Bhakti, for the kind introduction. And uh, first of all, at the outset, I would like to thank the Regional Science Center and Planetarium of Calicut under the National Council of uh, Science Museum, Ministry of Culture, Government of India. And also personally to you, Dr. Manas Bhakti, for arranging this uh, discussion. It is always a pleasure. I, and I, uh, I hope that students are also listening because they are the ones who will have to hold our ship um, afloat uh, in the coming times. So today what I thought I would do is to talk uh, about program cell death. I am basically a cell biologist and I have worked on program cell death uh, using different model systems during my career. And uh, so program cell death also is very important in immunology as well as infection. And so I thought I would talk a bit about that. And then we go ahead with uh, some of the issues of COVID, maybe what we are um, uh, looking at and what kind of issues are uh, coming afloat with this uh, uh, disease. And it is uh, no doubt that we are in unprecedented times. And it is mind boggling that from January to this uh, month, there has been 23,000 papers on COVID-19. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it shows that how people have actually gone about, scientists have actually um, gone about uh, doing a great deal of research. And we know as scientists, we know that it takes a long time to get anything 
really um, you know uh, in 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 uh, with evidence to to put it across. So uh, yeah, so what a bit worrying is that there are too many involvement in COVID nineteen right now, and all the other uh, kind of diseases uh, people are not right now paying any attention, but they haven't gone away. They are with us. So uh, that is a concern. Uh, but um, I think right now uh, this pandemic is something that has changed our lives totally. We actually go into another world with this, our social life falling apart and our um, health uh, has to be in proper shape to, to fight this infection. So um, I think um, we discuss a little bit about this disease as well. So if you can, you know, I, you want me to, uh, uh, I think I will stop at this introduction and you can just ask me what you would like sure. to. Sure, madam. Let, let us begin with, uh, and uh, uh, to begin with uh, and to put the perspective in proper place, uh, uh, I'd like to ask you, I mean, how does a cell take bath and how do they die to begin with? What is the background of it? What does it mean really? Okay, so um, I would like to put some slides so that people will have, uh, oh, you know, I will share. Sure. Uh, can you, can you, uh, is, can you able it uh, from there? So, sure, 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 man. sure. Yes, it is enabled. Yeah, it's enabled. Okay, share and I've shared. Now I will go. Yes. Okay, now, um, you know, that uh, um, I have put the title as Shaping of Life Involves Active Cell Death. The reason is that once the sperm fertilizes the egg, the one cell embryo is there. And after the two nuclei uh, fuse, we have the embryo dividing into two cells, four cells, uh, eight cells, 16 cells, so and so forth. And it forms eventually what is called a morula. You can see on the right hand side the uh, picture of a morula, which is a ball of cells. Now, from this ball of cells, an organism has to develop. Now, how does it develop? It, it develops by making a shape. And in that shaping of the embryo, there is a um, there is extensive cell death. Because if you see that there is a total sculpting of the embryo that happens over time. So uh, if cells did not die, we would all be a round ball of cells. We will not have hands, uh, legs, uh, you know, uh, all other appendages and even the body. So um, we uh, have trillions of cells in us and this is how cell death take place. Uh, like I would, I would like to draw a parallel here that when a sculptor starts uh, sculpting on a piece of stone, he uses a chisel to chisel out the shape. So exactly the chisel is here, the cell death, and the cell death chisels out the shape that we, the organism is, is, is uh, there in a way. So we as adult humans have trillions of cells in our body. Now, um, how many cells actually die? So total cells in our body is 30 to 40 trillion. And you can see the mind boggling number that every day in our body about 1 billion new cells are formed. So if 1 billion new cells are formed, somebody has to make the space. So every second, something in the order of 1 million cells die in our bodies. And this death is so much so that in a given year, we lose the total amount of our body weight. So at the end of the year, sort of we are a new us. So um, this is how important cell death is because if there is so, many, so much cell death is taking place and cell birth is taking place, this is very important because, um, and, and why, now the question is why do the cells die? We have trillions of cells, but why do the cells die? Now cells can die of um, uh, one of the reasons I showed you that during development, as it is programmed, the cells will die. And cells in essence, so cells would divide over about 50, 60 times. 
and then they get old like we all do and uh, cells will die then and then cellular stress when a healthy perfectly healthy cell can have stress and the stress can come from um, you know radiation uh, oxidative stress then uh, you know pollute exposure to pollutants and the cell may decide to die and again it can cell an infected cell the body tries to kill an in, in, infected cell so due to infection also the cells can die so you see the death is there everywhere in a way that uh, it is it is it is mainly i would say development cell 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 stress and infection and here uh, how do they die there is a cell suicide program which is activated now if we have to understand a bit about that then we have to go in details about program cell death okay and and that is exactly my next question uh, when you say that uh, there is something called programmed cell death uh, uh, what is that and uh, we understand that there is a term uh, connected to it it is called apoptosis uh, something like that yes. and what is that yes. really and why is it so important and just taking a cue from your previous uh, description i have another curiosity that uh, you said it's a requirement of sculpting really uh, that prompts uh, cell death or at least uh, that uh, is facilitated by cell death but when we grow into our full size then what is the role of it why at all it is required yes yes when we grow into our full size as i said that cell senescence as you can see in my slide that cells would get old they would go 50 60 times they will divide and they will go grow old they will not be as uh, efficient as they were and so they will uh, their cell death will be there and they will be replaced by the the dividing cells they are coming from the stem cells in the organs and they will be replaced and then there can be cell stress as i said due to exposure to various uh, kinds of stimuli and uh, stress can lead to death and then above all there is a, we are exposed to much infection and so infection due to infection cells can uh, also die now you asked a question that what is uh, program cell death now i here and also you said which is called apoptosis now one thing i would like to say that program cell death is the inherent program in the cells that actually takes the cell from a uh, normal state to death now and apoptosis earlier when first these terms were laid apoptosis was actually describing the phenotype of that death but now both program cell death or pcd and apoptosis are used in the same um, you know same sort of synonymously so uh, you know you can call it apoptosis you can call it program cell death so it's kind of used synonymously so it is um, it is a type of death that initiates a cascade of signaling events that uh, that can happen due to developmental cues that can happen due to uh, stress that can happen due to old age of the cells that can happen due to an infection so these are the cues on which this program cell death can start and so that is the stimuli now the whole idea of program cell death this basically a cell when it is dying if it dies by some a process called necrosis when the cell will burst and release your its contents there can be inflammation so the whole purpose of program cell death or apoptosis is to um, dismantle the cell in neat little structures and those structures are eaten up by phagocytic cells and disposed of neatly so what we get is actually a cell into small balls i will show a, a picture here and so that there is no spillage of contents you can see this a national us national library of medicine picture where they are showing that the white blood cells is coming up and picking up this uh, small balls of cells now why do they need to get small the reason is it is it is easy for the phagocytes to pick them up so the cell just dismantled itself into this small little uh, different sized but small sized uh, structures and they are picked up by the uh, white blood cells or our uh, macrophages and then disposed of so the body doesn't see any inflammation so this is why program cell death or apoptosis is very very important 
And uh, if I, I could just talk about the process of it, is that when the cell begins, sure. it's okay? Yeah. Uh, when yeah. cell begins its apoptosis, it, there is a signal and then there is initiation of signaling. There is a huge array of molecules that can take part here. So depending on the type of death pathway that is, uh, that is uh, stimulated, the, the different molecules like BCL2 family of proteins or even the fast parcel, these are some of the, I didn't want to make it very complicated. So these are some of the molecules that are activated and the biochemical changes are brought about. Now, execution uh, processes like digestion of cellular contents is very essential to make these into small ball of cells because you need to dismantle all the cytoskeletal structures to collapse the cell and then to uh, sort of make it into small um, uh, structures. So the execution processes are carried out by a very specialized set of enzymes for caspases that cut at precise, um, uh, precise positions of proteins. So after the caspase is dismantled, the cell shrinkage occurs. And you can see here, um, there is, uh, cells are becoming smaller. There is a nuclear condensation. Cells dismantled and are picked up by the phagocytes. So the, fa the picking up of the cell by the phagocyte is called corpse clearance. And it is with the corpse clearance that the process of programmed cell death or apoptosis is completed. So um, if now the question is what happens if, uh, if uh, the uh, apoptosis or programmed cell death is not normal, what happens? So there are a variety of things which happens. If you can see the two simple examples is that our fingers, we are born with webbed fingers. Now they, the cells between them need to die. And even with the tail of the tadpole, the cells die by apoptosis there. And um, if apoptosis do not occur, then you get abnormalities like this. And it is interesting, the term apoptosis actually came from the Greek word, from where, you know, where the, cell, where the uh, branches fall off from the tree, small uh, branches. There, the cells die by apoptosis. So that's why it's called apoptosis. Now, uh, there can there are many diseases in which alterations of apoptosis are involved. For example, cancer. In cancer, what happens? There is less amount of programmed cell death or apoptosis, and that leads to tumor. How does that happen? Now, the thing is, the the uh, the whole process is derailed by whatever mechanisms are there to make the cells, uh, to prevent the cells from dying by disabling all the molecules that are required for death and the cells then uh, accumulate and they form the tumors. Now, same thing happens in case of neurological disorders. Now with neuro neurological disorders, it is interesting that if they, it is, there is more death, there are problems in the brain. If it is less death, there are problems in the brain. So apoptosis is very vital for the, for the brain. And then cardiovascular disorders and, of course, autoimmune diseases, which, you know, which uh, is dependent on apoptosis. So there are, there are many diseases that can happen with irregular apoptosis. So, um, and I, as, I, as I told that infection is very important because uh, during infection, PCD must occur. Why? Because when a pathogen invades a cell, Two things can happen: the pathogen can take over and run the uh, can take over and just um, uh, cause an infection, or the host can try to kill the pathogen so that it's safe. So then, in case of that, there is no infection. But there comes a situation when the host is unable to uh, kill the pathogen, so the host decides to die, and here program cell that comes in and programmed cell death is affected, and then uh, the host cell is dead. So along with the host cell, the uh, along with that small balls that I showed you forming, the pathogen is also uh, discarded. But at times what happens, many, I mean, there are many examples of this 
that when a pathogen takes over uh, sort of uh, the causing the infection it actually um, derails the process of normal process of cell death in that particular cell so without that normal process of cell death the cell cannot die and the infection thrives so when it infects the next cell it will do the same it is called a subversion of host cell apoptosis so that this is why in case of infection this is very important Okay, uh, madam, just before we uh, get into uh, more detail of infections and all that, uh, I have a little curiosity about uh, your own research. I understand uh, you used various types of parasites as models to understand the conditions under which cells respond to their environment and uh, kill themselves. If need be, then it happens like that. Uh, I would like to ask you, why is it important to know all that? And does it uh, open any clues to new therapy and treatment uh, uh, so that it becomes important? Yes. Um, you know, uh, when you study simpler systems, which are easier to handle, um, you can get clues to systems which evolve later. And that is why these uh, organisms, which are which are, um, you know, much simpler, single cell. And, you know, at one point in time, at the time of evolution, the multicellularity evolved. And before the multicellularity evolved, these unicellular organisms were there. So it is important to know how um, the process of death evolved. And that sort of sometimes gives us clues that, that is this the way that the, uh, the the systems seen in higher organisms evolved? And can we find um, uh, path pathways? Can we delineate pathways that are present in these organisms and find homologues in the higher ones? And from there, we can find um, uh, we can we can sort of identify drugs that can that can affect the hubs of um, cell death. And that can either increase cell death or decrease cell death as is required. So that is why I think simpler systems are very important. Okay. Uh, then let us get into a little bit of uh, understanding of the human immune system. Uh, what happens really when the human immune system encounters a pathogen? And uh, we understand uh, that there are cells called T cells, uh, um, something like that. Uh, if you may kindly give a brief of the for the rest of us who are uninitiated, uninitiated into the subject but are interested, what happens really when we face these pathogens? Uh, so there are uh, for that we need to know that there are two. Uh, the immune system has two arms. It has an innate immune system and it can be divided into innate and adaptive immune system. Now, innate immunity, which you can see on the left-hand side of the diagram, is a, is a, is a response. Uh, they are responsible for non-specific response. It is always present and ready to adjust. Now, many microbes have evolved, um, evolved uh, techniques to avoid innate immunity. And so as the innate immunity takes on from anywhere from zero to 12 hours or even a bit more, the adaptive immune system is waiting to make its move. <clears throat> so that can have, that comes at a later portion. So you see the NK cells, the natural killer cells, the, they can directly kill infected cells. The macrophages, they can kill infected cells, but macrophages and dendritic cells are actually antigen presenting cells. So what, what they essentially do is to uh, take in the uh, pathogen and then digest it. And then the peptides are there. They are presented on the surface of both the dendritic cells and macrophages. And these are presented to the adaptive immune system, the T cells and B cells, and there the adaptive immunity comes in. Now, um, so there are, uh, like for example, in the COVID, uh, in the, the SARS-CoV-2, they have, which is shown in vitro, that they have a way to um, uh, stop the interferon gamma release by uh, the um, by the macrophages 
in, in during the initial part of infection and which uh, is antiviral. So that antiviral action is thwarted by these um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. So like that, they, once the pathogen enters the body, so the natural immunity works, but then the in the meantime, the helper T cells get activated by the antigens presented to it, and um, it produces cytokines. When it produces cytokines, it actually helps the B cells to um, to sort of uh, produce antibodies. The B cells then um, differentiate into plasma cells and they produce antibodies. So this is how the two uh, pathways work. And the killer uh, T cells here also recognizes the pathogen antigens by very specialized molecules that are present on pathogens and the, uh, they recognize it and uh, then it kills the cells. But this is, the story is not so simple. It's a bit complicated here because the, uh, we have a system, we have a set of genes called the major histocompatibility loci in which it is, it encodes the HLA um, and it, in the human leukocyte antigen, it's called, and it, it encodes the HLA, which are a group of genes that coding for proteins found on the surface of cells that helps the immune system to recognize foreign substances. So when a pathogen invades, so there is a kind of an alarm going on in the body. And uh, when the alarm goes on, what happens is that the antigen is actually presented by the, um, uh, the as I said, dendritic cells and macrophages. Now, this antigen presentation is a very, very specialized work by these cells. There is a set of uh, proteins, which are the HL, HLA. They actually are coded by the HLA that these, these proteins are taken to the surface of the cell. These antigens, these this viral antigens, in any pathogen antigens are taken to the surface of the cells by these proteins. So there is a large polymorphism in these loci because we have undergone very heavy microbial load during our lifetime. And it has happened in history that human populations have been exposed to um, infections where very few people actually lived. They lived because they had a, they had a HLA profile that could, that could withstand uh, that infection because they presented the antigens well. So that is why each person we, each person, each of us, have different alleles of genes that actually make up our HLA type. And um, therefore, each person would be of unique haplotype, and that accounts for many differences that we have in our response to any pathogen. So this MHC uh, major histocompatibility complex is very important. And um, the I will show how, it, how they bring it. Uh, bring to the next one. Yes, you see, the there is there are viral and intracellular bacterial infection tackled by a particular HLA group. Then again, um, another HLA group, but bacterial and fungal infection are taken care of by another HLA group. So that is why having different HLAs matter. So now, if you look at the activation of T cells, as I was saying. This is a this is a uh, cell which is infected. So it lysosomally digests the uh, the pathogen, and the pathogen's antigen fragments are in the cytosol. The MHC molecule is also in the cytosol, but it it binds to this and brings it to the surface where the T cell receptor actually binds to it to recognize it. So. This can be many, I mean, as varied, this will be so, such a varied thing that many antigens that we face during our lifetime will give a variety of antigens and that is why MHC need to be very, very uh, uh, diverse. So once this is recognized, the cytotoxic T cells gets activated and it can now kill the cells by... Um, through apoptosis. Now, uh, the helper T cell is also get, they also get activated by a uh, semi similar process. Now, the cytotoxic T cell is presented by MHC class 1 uh, molecules, whereas in this case, it is class 2 MHC molecule. 
class 2 mhc molecule is present only in the um, uh, only in the antigen presenting cells and class 1 is present in all nucleated cells so the helper t cell in its turn can actually um, activate a cytotoxic T cell by the same process of antigen presentation. If you look at this picture, it shows that this is two schematic. So you see here the alpha beta chains of the HLA molecule will sort of hold the peptide together and then take it to the T cell. So that is how antigen presentation takes place and that is why it is extremely important that we have a variety in the MHC molecules because that determines our ability to distinguish between pathogens or, or, to, or to mount a proper immune response. So this is the adaptive immune response where the antigen presenting cells are actually binding to CD4 T cell, which is the helper T cell and binding to the killer T cell. And uh, they, they, uh, they mature into mature CD8 T cell here. And the CD4 helper T cell uh, uh, actually affects the B cells. It in induces the B cells to differentiate into plasma cells. And the plasma cells produce the antibodies that we very much request. On the other hand, plasma cells also give rise to memory B cells, which remain in our system. And the memory B cells are re required for the future when we encounter the same antigen. Now, the mature uh, CD8 T cells kill the infected cells by the process of apoptosis by through a special enzyme system called the granzyme and the perforin system, but it is still through apoptosis, so there is no inflammation. And that is when, when these go um, haywire, then there, is, there are inflammatory incidences. Uh, so we, okay, so um, in this... Let's know uh, a little more about the uh, corona, in fact, you are already there, perhaps. Uh, but is, is this process something very general or something special happens uh, when we encounter the corona infection? No, this is not. Um, uh, I mean, I would say the whole process is always, uh, you know, the way it works, it works same for all pathogens. But corona being highly contagious, what happens? It's a root of infection. You see, we have HIV, but, be, but because of the root of infections, it's not so prevalent. But in case of coronavirus, which comes through the eyes, through the nose, and um, enters our uh, nasopharyngeal region, and what happens is that at the back, at the back of the throat, you can see here, the epithelial cells at the back of the throat, they get infected. And where the virus, through its spike proteins, that we know that they just spikes on the surface, through its spike proteins, is bind to the ACE2 receptors on the surface of the cells. Now, once it binds to the ACE2 receptors, some other molecules are activated. And now the virus is competent to fuse with the cell membrane so that it can release its genetic material inside the cell. So the, that is how these, these are getting um, infected. And at this point of time, the um, innate immune system gets activated. So the macrophages will come in and the, um, the dendritic cells will come in and the innate immune system will start. Now, if they can take care of the viral load over there, which may be more, because it is very important what kind of viral loads do we have. It may be uh, more, it may be less. So in case of... A C innate immune system is unable to take care of it, and the virus goes into the lungs. And once the virus goes into the lungs, then there is a system which works there also. That in the alveoli there are um, uh, there are macrophages that will secrete cytokines. So at some point of time, the the the, the patient will recover. At some point of time, he or she will not. So we, we, will, we will discuss about that uh, a little later. And um, it's the same way. It's the innate immunity and it's the adaptive immunity. It's the same way it works for this pathogen as well. Uh, here the question comes that uh, 
we find that this uh, coronavirus is very much virulent. Its uh, virulence is uh, the first thing that comes to our mind. The problem is uh, when we face some pathogen, as you said, that our it encounters our normal immune system and that uh, reduces the virulence quite a bit. But uh, it is not the case apparently in case of corona. Is it somehow subverting the innate uh, immune system? It is not subverting the innate immune system. It is actually causing a havoc there by uh, drawing too many cells and then creating. Uh, and, and since they, uh, the viruses are somehow uh, trying to suppress the innate immune activity, the, the cells are uh, becoming overreactive. And when they become overreactive, there is this kind of cytokine storm that happens. So the, it is actually at the level of innate immunity, these kind of things are happening. And uh, it is not bypassing. It is actually, um, uh, it's, it's the protective response versus the non-protective response kind of thing that um, um, the, the, there is a cytokine storm because too many cells have come in, too many cytokines are secreted. That is the reason. Um, so... So if, you, if we look uh, at the sort of a cytokine storm, um, yeah, so it's actually the uncontrolled overproduction of soluble markers. Now, immune activity is increased by cytokines. So the immune system at some point of time is totally deregulated and is unable to control itself, unable to stop itself. And at this, here, there are chemokines also. What are chemokines? Basically, chemokines are chemoattractants and they draw the immune cells to the site of infection. Now, then immune cells actually encroach beyond the what happens is at this point of time, the, um, uh, the system is upset and the immune cells can reach out to the infected body part and attack the healthy tissues. Um, the blood vessels also open up, letting in the immune cells into the tissues. And that is why in case of coronavirus infection, it is seen that the uh, various tissues are affected. It is not only the lungs. But if we um, you know, sort of go into this, uh, this, this schematic, what you see here is that when we breathe in through trachea, the, we are taking in the virus. And the virus finally lands up in the alveoli. And in the alveolus, what happens is that there are type 1 and type 2 uh, alveolar cells. So the infection has landed up here. And now the immune reaction has started in the sense that type 2 cells are secreting chemoattractants to draw immune cells to the place so that the pathogen can be killed. In that case, what happens that so the, the immune cells will arrive and if the viral load is low, they can just... Uh, kill the viral load and we have we go away with a mild infection but if the infection is a bit more and the spike proteins are able to bind to ACE2 receptors and uh, bind to these cells what bind to the alveolar cells what happens especially the type 2 which has the ACE2 receptors so especially what happens is then immune cells come in and cause so much cytokine secret so much cytokine that the cells uh, the fluids start accumulating from the cells. And this is a kind of a moderate infection where there are, the alveolus is half full of fluid. And this can just go away and people can recover from this uh, situation and uh, they will not go into further into the disease. But in sometimes it happens that if the, if the system of the cells coming in uh, is deregulated and more cells come in, starts secreting too much cytokine, inflammatory reaction is at its peak. And at that point of time, the protein-rich fluid accumulates within the alveoli. And this actually causes a burst in the system. And so the, the, uh, the, the, the virus can just enter through the bloodstream to the different organs. And then in, in inflamm this inflammatory the reaction is actually the cause of the virus going into different organs and where the different organs can be affected and um, you know the, the, 
the, the patient can collapse actually due to the um, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, they go through it and they can collapse. So that is why this is the very, 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 very severe reaction. And it is, it is only because that there is an influx of uh, too many cells and secretion of too many cytokines and chemo, too much cytokines and chemokines. Then, madam, if that is the mechanism, then how do you uh, differentiate that for some cases, uh, uh, for some people, some patients, uh, the infection is quite severe and the disease becomes very, very critical. And uh, for some, it is not. And it is also seen uh, that one who is apparently doing quite well, all of a sudden drops off the cliff and they immediately uh, becomes uh, very bad very soon. Is there any explanation for that? See, to, when I explain the immune system, uh, it is, uh, you know, how you will respond to an infection will depend on your haplotype, HLA haplotype is one. And secondly, then there are many signaling pathways, many cells that are involved. So, it, so each one of us will respond to the infection in a very different way. So that is why some people are infected uh, get away with less infection and some people get away with, you know, um, uh, moderate infection and some people will die because of a severe infection. So there are many components to it. It is not only HLA, HLA, then there are signaling pathways in cells, then there are aging of cells. So because in aging patients, we see that uh, there is a lymphopenia, naturally with age, the T cell counts go down. So if if your immune cell count goes down, then you become very vulnerable to these infections. So that is why in, even in case of uh, younger people, you do see um, a, a kind of, um, you know, uh, lymphopenia when this infection strikes. And if that lymphopenia cannot be recovered, if you cannot regain your cell numbers, then you are going to, going to go into the next part, uh, next uh, 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 stage of the disease and eventually you'll have a very, very severe attack. Uh, wh when you talked about... So, uh, yeah. there was, yes, madam. You were saying... No, I, I thought... I thought... Huh, I was saying that you know, the, there is, it all depends on how much viral load you have. Okay. So in case of a severe viral load, this MHC keeps on producing T cells. And at some point of time, there is a T cell exhaustion. And, and when that exhaustion happens, T cells can also get deleted. And in that, these viral particles which are being uh, sensed by the macrophages and the inflammatory cytokines are being released, then the situation can regress. And that is, that is what happens in case of aging patients. And so, so um, yeah, that, that, that if, you can see, if you can put this slide, the healthy part, and this part, which is a which is a disease part. So in the healthy healthy part, the normal CD8 T cells will come and kill the viruses. But in case of the uh, alveoli where fluid is accumulating, the neutrophil has come in. A lot of neutrophils come in, and neutrophils secrete uh, reactive oxygen species. They secrete uh, peroxidases. So neutrophils also affect other cells as well. So there can be a collapse of T uh, this uh, this. And you have type 2 cells and type 1 cells. And that is how it happens. Yes, please, you're saying something. Yes, I was uh, talking about the last time when you talked about uh, uh, the memory cells and all that. It appears that as if, if we get an infection once and we come out uh, winning over it, uh, probably the immune system remembers the infection. And the next time around, if we face the same infection, it's better or easier for it to fight with that. But in case of coronavirus, we are also hearing of reinfection. Uh, then how is that occurring? Is it true, firstly? And then if it is so, what about it? I mean, is it possible that there is a chance of reinfection? Yes, there is a chance of reaction uh, in reinfection. Uh, the reason being that, you know, in case of uh, reaction, uh, reinfection, what will happen is that you have got an infection, you have mounted an immune response. Now, your immune response that is going to be sustained in your body is going to be the antibodies. Now, just producing antibodies doesn't help. 
the antibodies needs to be functional so it is not that everybody produces a very functional antibody repertoire and in that case what happens that the patients uh, who, patient who has recovered is vulnerable to another set of infections because he doesn't have an adequate protection from the previous uh, memory cells because he, one has to remember production of the memory cells again is not the same same in every case so if you don't have enough memory cells to trigger your uh, one thing is that you don't have enough circulating antibodies so you get reinfected if you are a first line uh, worker in the or get re reinfected very fast or if you are anybody in the in the in the population you can get reinfected in a reasonable amount of time if you don't have the circulating antibodies if you do have the circulating antibodies but they are not functional then also you will get reinfected so reinfection chance is always there but what is the current knowledge about it uh, is it is it is it really reported uh, in proper form that there were cases of reinfection at all it is a bit confusing yes because there are because uh, uh, because yes so one thing we have to realize that we are into this for about 5 months for in real studies that are going on it's for about 5 months so there is a lot of confusion in the data so what we are calling not it's not still we have to uh, look at the reinfection so uh, till much studies are done more studies are done kind of a uh um, uh what should i say confusion in 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 where people are working near the patients who is getting infected who is getting reinfected so that kind of data it is very difficult to get that kind of data so uh, that's why there is no um, no parity uh, in data from different sources okay Uh, exactly taking yeah. taking cue from your last question i was trying to uh, come up here itself uh, we hear that uh, there are roles of uh, cytokines and chemokines uh, in, in this respect in, in a very strong way experts say that uh, a highly fatal immune system process called cytokine storm that you mentioned uh, that uh, happens and then that becomes the real threat for uh, the whole coronavirus infection i'd like to understand the, it a bit i mean what it is or why is it so fat, fatal and can it be predicted uh, in any way yeah if you look at uh, if you look at this particular slide uh, il6 is the one which is secreted in good amounts so il6 uh, levels and some other levels of some other cytokines may sort of give you an indication that a cytokine there is an impending cytokine storm now uh, cytokine storm uh, actually essentially means that the immune system has gone haywire and um, the cytokines are coming and causing a huge amount of inflammation and see that happens in 5% of patients if you look at that you have 15% patients who are moderately severe but the severe patients in the about 5% patients the cytokine storm actually happens and it is very difficult to save them there are uh, you can block il6 by the true drugs toclizumab and charli uh, but these are these are anti cancer antibodies actually they are antibodies used for cancer treatment and they can prevent il6 it is it is possible to predict by looking at the cytokine profile and uh, there are not um, enough studies to correlate that yes it is this particular x kind of cytokine profile will predict a cytokine storm but i think we have made a headway on that and we can now predict that in this particular patient a possible cytokine storm is uh, coming so in that case you can use uh, drugs and uh, to to prevent that now how much it has worked i am not sure about the uh, reports okay so yeah so you, you, mm -hmm. you think that uh, if we further make uh, uh, headways into this subject then probably some uh, cytokine storm can be predicted i mean already we know that there are certain cytokines which grow uh, which which actually increase during 
prior to the cytokine storm coming and inflammatory ones so we will have we can predict actually we can probably uh, mathematicians can make a model that amount of cytokine it will come to this and uh, so i think it's quite the research is showing that it will be predictable and then proper drug and uh, there are these strong antivirals that are being used and you know uh, it will be possible to treat it also perhaps okay uh, though you have explained it uh, quite a bit uh, even then since the things are pretty complex i would like to bring you one point uh, uh, to explain it a little more that we understand that covid 19 is known to be a mutant i mean some in some cases it uh, lives away with mild flu like symptoms and uh, uh, in some cases it becomes uh, very very serious uh, and we have read reports that the virus takes over nasal uh, nasal pharynx cells lung cells and liver and nerve cells to some extent still and when it is widespread then only we understand uh, something havoc has already happened i mean what is the mechanism why does it happen like that and why it is so stealthily attacking um stealthily attacking means that you know once as i showed you one uh, Uh, uh slide where we have gone into this um i'm just going back to it like you have you have the virus first entering either through your eyes or through your nose or you know through the throat and it affects your uh, uh, the cells at the back of your throat now from here uh, how how can it go to different organs basically it goes to the lungs creates an inflammation over there and in the acute patients the virus is released into the blood stream so that it can reach the organs and that happens because the blood um, because the blood vessels are affected and that's why these can reach to different organs and in the brain also i mean it it, it affects the cells over there and it virtually ravages the body by affecting any organ where cells are rich in ace2 receptors so ace2 receptor is very important in whichever organ ace2 receptor are there the spike protein is able to bind and enter the cells and um, you know create uh, create a lot of inflammation so that organ failure occurs eventually it's the organ failure which occurs we find that nearly 80% of the covid-19 patients are said to be asymptomatic while the rest are critically unwell in to reports what does it mean from an immunological point of view uh, why some people are asymptomatic and uh, showing a much more intense reactions you know the uh, asymptomatic is probably the actually is heal what you call for treatment of uh, or treatment or prevention of uh, covid 19 because the asymptomatic persons we have to realize that what does asymptomatic uh, mean first of all these um, uh, the 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 are they in the pre pre disease state is it um, you know whether it is there in the pre disease state in the sense that they will get sick in about 10 days in about a month or whatever so um you see in i put this slide so that you know 80% people appears to be asymptomatic that is the that is chinese studies are saying that italian studies are saying that so uh so so it is quite severe actually a lot of people are asymptomatic now in new york city it has shown that out of one in five residents where may have been infected they didn't know and they have antibody running antibody so they must have been asymptomatic so this is actually a very very um, significant problem now who are asymptomatic if we consider asymptomatic patients that are they in the pre disease state have they undergone uh, gone through the disease and they have recovered and that is why they are still asymptomatic but they have a lot of antibodies which are circulating in the system they must be having a very good immune system so that they have virus 
but they are not um, showing any symptoms. So uh, there are there are a lot of questions that answers. So how do you identify them? See, because we are we are not looking at the asymptom, we are not testing asymptomatic people. But if we test asymptomatic people, we will really have a good figure. In our country, I'm talking about, we'll have a huge figure here. And um, what what are the, what is the role of these asymptomatic people when they transmit the disease? Now, one asymptomatic person can have a viral load which is low, and another asymptomatic person can have viral load which is much higher. So we don't know about the different viral loads that different asymptomatic patients, asymptomatic subjects carry that we don't know. And if they would develop disease or not, we also don't know. Maybe, maybe down the lane they will, you know, develop the disease. And is it that they have a different immune response than the ones that are symptomatic, that are showing, say, say mild symptoms, they're showing mild symptoms. Do they have a different uh, immune response? We don't know that. And um, uh, so there also we have to see that are we looking at false positives also? Because in some cases, um, we can just have false positives and we can consider, oh, no, this guy is asymptomatic, but doesn't have the disease. So, so these are the few things that we have to consider. But the sheer load that has been reported by the different countries uh, makes uh, it's, it a bit worrisome that how, how are we going to actually tackle these asymptomatic carriers? Because now when I go out somewhere, I think, oh, is this guy asymptomatic carrier? He's not having, he's not coughing or sneezing, but he may be an asymptomatic carrier. So this is also a very, uh, become a very difficult uh, thing to um, tackle. No, uh, you mean, uh, that means uh, we should study the asymptomatic cases uh, in much more depth as well. That is what uh, you say in, uh, from research point of view. Yes, because unless we identify that, we wouldn't know how the disease is actually being spread. So asymptomatic carriers appear to be the main people who are doing the community transmission because nobody knows they are, uh, they are having the disease. So I think that is a very important um, aspect. But then until we have cheaper kits and we can look at a sizable amount of population to identify the asymptomatic carriers and sort of follow them, uh, we are not going to have the answers. By studying them, is it at all possible at any point of time, either by studying them or in any other way, that we can precisely modulate the immune system? Is it possible? Uh, see, uh, immune, immune system modulation is usually done by treatment with cytokines and other things. But uh, immune systems are so different in different people that I personally do not believe that it is, you can precisely modify uh, modify an immune system. I don't think it's possible. You can to some extent, but. Uh, let us get to another thing which is being said that uh, it is not very sure ultimately uh, whether we can have any medicine or any other uh, vaccine or something like that. Uh, and it is the herd immunity that is being talked about uh, so much. And it is believed that herd immunity will soon develop against uh, most major strains of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what do you think about that? Is it possible? Is it a possibility? We, we actually do not have a data where we know that a person infected today has, and from three months from now, uh, six months from now, one year from now, will have antibodies or not. If that person do not have protective, and I'm talking about protective antibodies, not just antibodies. So if that uh, that particular person do not have protective antibodies, he may um, he may not um, he may get sick again, and he may also spread the disease. So um, the herd immunity by natural infection is difficult. And we have no idea that after coronavirus infection, how long the immunity stays, how long the antibodies stay. 
we have no idea actually virtually the, the time has not elapsed all to also to see that three months six months nine months one year do we have the antibodies and if we do have the antibodies are they quality antibodies we don't know now herd immunity can work best with vaccination so if we have vaccination of course we can uh, you know build the herd immunity and that's when it will work natural infection immune giving herd immunity will depend on how strong the infection can create an immune response and produce antibodies if it doesn't have functional antibodies there will be no herd immunity so um, that's where it lies actually. so it is not really obvious that uh, in the long run we will develop a herd immunity and we all be immune from it it is not ob that obvious no it is not that obvious for a simple reason is that when when we have a vaccine say suppose hypothetically we have a vaccine then only you can vaccinate people um so many people and also so many people you can vaccinate people and start getting a herd immunity but it will depend whether um whether your vaccine is good enough now if you look at history that we have had a ebola vaccine 43 years down the lane after the virus was first discovered we don't have a vaccine for hiv still now so and this we are rushing because we don't have a, have a any other way to treat it so we are rushing for the vaccine how good a vaccine will come we don't know so um uh, normally it takes 10 to 15 years to make a vaccine but this we are actually you know making it in 6 months 10 months 8 months whatever so uh, how good a vaccine we will have we don't know we have modern ways of making vaccines now like you can have a rna vaccine dna vaccine none of those vaccines are approved by fda i mean not we do not have a single uh, nuclear acid vaccine um, you know recommended by fda so so it is a very difficult scenario about the vaccine so uh, today only i read that uh, the oxford vaccine they are making a billion million doses or billion doses to give it to people but uh, do we actually have the studies that says that it is working so uh, you know hardcore vaccinologists will be able to tell that whether giving a vaccine without knowing that it is going to work or not is advisable or not okay uh, madam uh, we are thankful that our uh, uh, south zone director mr madan gopal is uh, with us online and uh, he has just put up a question for you uh, he, has, <laughs> he has asked this question that there are reports of the virus causing thrombosis what probably is a little different from the technique that you have already uh, mentioned is it true or can there be any other uh, mechanism by which this thrombosis can occur no uh, there are reports that this virus because it's uh, uh, because it is allowing the uh, see the the reactions in the alveoli where um, the, there is blood leakage and viruses are getting into the blood stream somehow they are causing uh, embolisms so um, so the clot formation is there and uh, i am not aware that what is the mechanism of clot formation uh, by these viruses but actually he is right it is there and it's happening and many of the um, see when some person dies by corona uh, attack there there is this question of having post mortems and looking at it and they have found that there are um, you know blood clots all over the place you know there are some patients that they found Now, what mechanism it is doing? Um, I'm not uh, clear about that. Uh, we also have received another question from uh, one of our uh, colleagues, uh, and in fact, he is one of my friends, uh, Mr. B. V. Shivastava. Uh, he wants to ask: uh, Is there any particular coronavirus protein uh, that induces apoptosis, or can we really estimate, uh, uh, as you talked about vaccination? Uh, that how much time is required for one particular vaccine to come for a particular uh, variant uh, the uh, first question is about the uh, protein 
uh, if it has a protein that can induce apoptosis. See, we don't know about the coronavirus, but the SARS-CoV, the previous one, and 2002-2003 virus, it, it has a protein which can actually cause apoptosis of the cells. And uh, it finds a way to go out. And um, so it can kill cells. But with coronavirus, uh, too, I have not come across any report that talks about uh, the apoptosis, uh, causing apoptosis by a particular protein. It does cause apoptosis of cells, but which protein it uses, it's not known. And uh, what was the second question? The was, second question uh, was, second. is it at all possible in any case for a particular variant to estimate how much time it will take uh, to develop a vaccine? Uh, no, it's not possible. And I will uh, give you a slide. See, see, this is the vaccine development where you have a preclinical uh, setup where it is discovered, then phase one where it is with uh, some healthy adults, then phase two when side effects and immunogenicity is seen with hundreds of people targeted, then it's thousands of people. And ultimately, it's hundreds of thousands of people for safety and monitoring. Now, this happens in 10, 15 years, you know, in this, uh, uh, before that, this is preclinical pre trials also happen. So this is an extraordinary situation when we are rushing up this thing. And uh, it is very difficult to say the vaccine, like even the vaccine, which is going in phase three, I mean, this Oxford vaccine is going in phase three, whether that vaccine will actually be effective, because we have no idea about that. So, uh, and there are about, I think there are, uh, there are about 10 vaccine ca vaccines which are in different phases. So to answer your question, you see, this vaccine is, this is a vaccine by Moderna. This is uh, phase two, this is in phase two, this is in phase one, phase two. So like the most advanced one is this, uh, uh, this Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is in phase three, which is going into phase three. So, uh, so we, we will hope it will come out, but initially they had some problems with their clinical trials, uh, preclinical trials. So now how in humans, whether it will at all generate any functional antibody or not, we don't know. But they are saying by modeling, they are saying by uh, looking at uh, many predictions. So unless it actually uh, generates functional antibody that will neutralize the virus, and this virus also, you have to remember that this virus also mutates. And when it mutates, it becomes very difficult to uh, make a vaccine. And that has happened with Ebola, that has happened with uh, HIV. So um, uh, even with the flu, flu vaccines, you see the flu uh, virus keeps on mutating. So it is very difficult to predict. So uh, I don't know whether I'm going to be very hopeful about the vaccine scenario or we can be, I mean, I, you know, I have to be very Keep skeptical about crossed. it. We yes, still, we still have to keep our fingers crossed. Yes, so, yes. So we have to keep our fingers That is the only way. That is the only way we can return to some kind of normalcy. <laughs> uh, well, Madam, uh, my, my personal uh, interest is about some uh, differences that we observe in cases. Uh, one US study shows that uh, the rate of mortality is higher in the racial minorities like Afro-Americans. Uh, and uh, Latinos. Even in India, we believe that our mortality rates are lower than that in many other countries. Can there be any reason really? Yes, the, the, we can speculate a reason. One is that, as I told you, when I talked about the HLA, that the HLA uh, in Indians is very, very polymorphic. The reason being we have had, we have been exposed to high microbial load. And it depends what African Americans have been exposed to. But also at this point of time, we have to think about uh, uh, the kind of uh, social setups that people are coming from who are actually dying. Because the African Americans, uh, many of them live in, uh, you know, in situations which are not conducive to a very healthy living. They are, so it can be one of the reasons. Nutrition is one of the reasons. And HLA, of course, is you know in different ethnicity, the HLA differs, and that can make a population vulnerable to a virus, and that can make a population resistant to a virus. So not completely resistant, but less um, uh, proactively infection can cannot happen. So uh, so this could be the reason. Uh, taking up aside the social 
uh, social setups they are living in. But uh, given the current state of uh, data, do you think that we have enough quality data to opine about uh, these issues, whether ethnicity helps uh, or any other reason that way it makes a difference? No, no, because there are very few studies that people have done on the COVID infection and HLA haplotype. I mean, there are virtually no studies. Similarly, they have just started. <laughs> okay. Similarly, it is also said that mortality statistics globally suggest that men are twice more likely than women to succumb to this infection. Is it possible that women on average have a better and regulated immune response than men in case of pathogenic infections? Or is it possible that estrogen would have an immune system modulator role? Estrogen is known to modulate immune system. Uh, it is known to induce uh, immune system. But uh, I'm not sure about testosterone, whether it does all, or not. But there, there can be uh, another angle to this, that men are more exposed to infections. And that is why they are catching the infection. But um, as far as the disease progression is concerned, uh, women have been shown to be, uh, number of women have been shown to be less. But there, uh, you know, then again the age, because premenopausal women would have enough estrogen, whereas postmenopausal women will not have enough estrogen to fight uh, the whatever, if, if at all there is a difference. So uh, it is possible because estrogen is known to modulate the immune system, but any direct studies, uh, I'm not aware if there are any direct studies with uh, women where whose estrogen levels are uh, really, um, you know, in the prime of their life, it's high. So younger women will have more estrogen than older women. So whether in the towards the older age group, whether men and women are similar in number and towards the lower age group, are men and women different? I, I don't know. So that can be a way to study that. Okay. And similarly, it is also said that there are very few cases among the children. Uh, is that a possibility that children could be somehow protected? See, in children, uh, the immune system is developing. So in that, when the immune system is actually learning to distinguish between self and non-self, uh, the I will not be able to opine whether uh, because of the maturity of the immune system uh, they are not affected but it has now been reported in multiple cases i think quite a number of cases that children are coming up with a different sy symptom uh, they are coming up with a sort of a huge inflammatory um, disease uh, i mean I think about 50% of children who had uh, who were COVID-19 positive showed this inflammatory disease syndrome. In especially in New York, I have read about that 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 has happened. So it is it is entirely possible that because of their evolving immune system, they are they are responding in a very different way than adults. Okay. Uh Though you have talked a little, but still, I'd like to have a little more detailed view about this whole vaccine scenario. Uh, what is happening really in this uh, vaccine field? And uh, do you feel that it can help uh, uh, when we discover and formalize it after trials? Uh, uh, and by that time, already there is a hard immunity. Will it really help them? And what is the current scenario? I mean, where you are? You have shown this chart. Uh, uh, where we are, but what are the methods that are being adopted? Uh, what are being tried? What, what is the whole scenario in this vaccine case? Well, in the vaccine case, the first of all, there are multiple technologies that are being used. And uh, if you can look at this particular chart, you will see mRNA vaccine, DNA vaccine. Then they have these, they have taken this adenovirus and uh, because it's immunogenic and put. Uh, uh, put uh, SARS uh, proteins in there. Then inactivated virus, apparently in China, this inactivated virus vaccine has worked well. And um, 
So, uh, but it is, I don't know how safe it is to give the inactivated uh, vaccine because um, there are limitations that you can use the, an inactivated vaccine. So these are, these are only 10, but there are more than 120 candidates that are being uh, tried in different places, that are being de developed in different places. So uh, I would say it is a moon of science that this ex the whole vaccine field exploded and started studying um, the vaccines for coronavirus. But it, as I said, that it is the vaccine generates antibody, it's true. But whether that particular vaccine can generate functional antibodies that will provide protection, uh, I have no idea. So um, I would still be very cautious in predicting that when we are going to have the vaccine. Um, it, it takes so long to, uh, with all our, with all our energy, with all our uh, expertise, we have not been able to produce vaccines in less than 10 years so far. So how in this quick, uh, in this quick time, how we are going to make a vaccine and are they going to really work is the big question. So I cannot give you an answer because one has to be very, very cautious in predicting this. Uh, in, in, in connection with this, I have another question that uh, has there been any attempt to try uh, intact spike protein from different sub, for different subtypes uh, and uh, using that for a vaccine? I mean, instead of the RNA and DNA vaccine, has there been any attempt to create a protein vaccination? Yeah, the, if you can see the, the Novavax uh, here is, is a protein subunit they're using from the, from the spike protein. Oh, but they, and there are there are yes, in a, lot of, a lot of studies the spike spike protein uh, structural studies showing that multiple places in the spike protein multiple peptides can be used from the spike protein and uh, you know tried for the vaccine. Okay. Uh, and, and I have another question, madam, that the antimalarials have immunosuppressive activity and those are approved also in treating lupus. What's the risk in a population that are chronically treated with immunosuppressants that it will not really respond to mounting a vaccine at all? Is it a possibility? Uh, you are talking about uh, hydroxychloroquine? Yes. Hydroxychloroquine, you know, it has become an issue now that, uh, uh, you know, there was this Lancet paper which was withdrawn. And uh, in, in healthy individuals, the hydroxychloroquine probably works fine because if you have malaria, you take hydroxychloroquine and you get cured. So there probably is not a problem. But when you give it to patients who are very sick, we still don't know how much of its side effects are working or not. But in general, it looks like, I mean, it is being recommended by ICMR. It is being recommended by, not by FDA or not by CDC, but ICMR has recommended its use. So I would, uh, I would think that they have, uh, looked at enough data to see that it is safe to use it. So whether our uh, population which has already been given uh, anti-malarial drugs are particularly susceptible with some side effects about this hydroxychloroquine, I cannot comment on that. Okay. And a very recent study also says that uh, there were cases uh, where remdesivir is uh, known to uh, have some effect uh, uh, in treating this uh, problem. Uh, can there be any truth in it? Remdesivir is actually now, initially it was given to uh, people who were early in the disease, but now there have been, there were side effects, so they are now giving it to people who are very ill, very severely ill. Remdesivir is giving, given only to them. 
it's a it's it's a it's a drug that actually prevents viral replication but it also has its side effects so it is only given to people who are very sick so nothing as yet uh, can be established as a sure way of treatment not yet only we only know that uh, physical distancing works and prevention works not yet any drug that can really um, stop the disease because all these antivirals they have their they take their toll in in in, in the body you know? uh well madam uh, one question i also asked uh, professor majumdar uh, regarding uh, some controversial uh, issue and uh, uh, sensation that is created among all the people do you believe that this virus with kind of uh, 30 kilo bases of uh, rna length can be a man made virus or uh, can it just be tweaked out of the laboratory it can it be generated out of laboratory see we have to uh, believe in evidence based data so there are papers i think a couple of them that has looked into this possibility and they have uh, actually analyzed the viral backbone and uh, also certain parts of the virus and it seems that it is impossible to make this virus in the laboratory so we have to Uh, you know sort of believe evidence based data and uh, say that it is not ma- made in the laboratory it uh, you know it's it's actually fairly uh, established with uh, other diseases as well that it jumps species from uh, bats to probably pangolins and natural selection worked on them in the bats or in the pangolins to make it uh, uh, transmittable to humans and uh, then human to human transmission took place because natural selection worked in within the uh, humans some human who it got transmitted to so uh, so this kind of uh, thing may have happened it probably not it probably the evidence says that it's not it cannot be made in the laboratory okay uh- madam thank you so much for uh, talking in so much of detail about the <clears throat> corona virus and all but i have some other uh, interest also i was going through your uh, statements and uh, writing here and there and i found that you talked about communicating science very aggressively i was going through very recently one of the Uh, scientific american articles in which uh, the editor said that uh, ignorance can be a very effective vector for disease uh, so uh, you also everywhere talked about very strong uh, aggressive communication of science now my question is what role do you exactly suggest that the science center since we work in science centers they should take regarding this aggressive propagation of scientific uh, ideas you see um, i think uh, students particularly should be uh, given a lesson in science irrespective of what they want to become in life they may become scientists or they may become may become you know uh, writers they become composers uh, singers uh, they have other choices in life but to have everybody to everybody to have a certain background in science helps and you know without uh, we would be poorer without the literature and without art so it is um, but it is essential that even uh, in society in the adults we should populate this information about science so people can make informed choices today we are discussing about this covid um, uh, virus and we are seeing that what is effective is the lockdown effective is the is the vaccine is going to come all these you know people are already talking about flattening of the curve the peak of the curve so it has percolated to society that people have started talking some kind of science so i think the science centers also should aggressively portray the current problems in um, that we are facing so one of the things i find very uh, effective in uh, in engaging students is that you 
show them the history of modern science in a sense that having some iconic piece of um, you know you know iconic piece in for for demonstrations. So the young students get very attracted that you know our the, the landmark things that we have done in science. And other than that, do make them conscious about what is uh, what is actually happening um, in the world and what they should be conscious of because they are going to be the ones who are going to live in this world and carry it forward. Uh, like we are having, uh, I mean, many species are actually becoming extinct and our biodiversity is compromised. So they should be aware about that. They should be aware about climate uh, changes. They should be aware about the sustainable um, sustainable developments that we should make uh, to thrive on. And then uh, deforestation is happening. Um, uh, so, 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 and the pandemic. That uh, are we geared for the next pandemic? So, the science centers should take an active role in attracting young people to know about these things. That's what I'm saying, that you can go in science, you may not go in science, but you should have a very basic knowledge about science. I'm saying that without literature and art, we would be poorer. So we need, but those people also should know. Like in today's world, everybody is discussing coronavirus. I have not seen, I've seen artists discussing coronavirus. Of course. Whereas they are painting coronavirus. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so the, so I think science centers have a major role and they should be able to attract people. Now, for the timing, we are locked down, but they should be able to attract people. I'll return to it, madam. But incidentally, by this time, I have got a very interesting question from one of our viewers. Uh, Mr. Melinda asks this question that if I am infected by a person who is very severely affected and if I am affected by, I'm infected by one person who is asymptomatic, will it cause any difference? It will all depend on how much virus load you got. See, the, there is a there is a study where they are doing that patients. Some of the patients give out enormous viral load. Some of the patients give lesser viral load. Even if they are equally ill, one patient will give more viral load. One patient will give less viral load. So it depends on how much viral load you got it from. There is some asymptomatic person or a symptomatic person. So it is kind of your luck that how, how much virus you got. Uh, mm, I, I got another question from another uh, viewer, madam. Uh, Taputi Chakraborty asks, uh, can RNA interference be used to target this virus? Uh, RNA treatments have been tried. But uh, uh, how effective it will be against this particular virus is uh, I cannot, uh, you know, comment without uh, without looking at studies. But I do not think, uh, although in the initial period there were some RNAi studies were going on, and they were probably in vitro. Um, that if they are able to uh, kill the virus or not, see viral RNA. You have the viral RNA which is actually injected in the cells. Theoretically, RNA can work. But whether it has been tested by someone, I do not know. I'm sorry. And uh, another question that we have received is uh, from Dr. Raj Marotra, and he asks, uh, what is your opinion about uh, our uh, modus operandi, what it should be? Should whether should we just go on rampant testing or test only those people who are showing some kind of symptoms? I think for the long run, it is important to test um, uh, test uh, many people in the society because uh, because of the simple reason that then we get a whole picture of how many asymptomatic people are around and how many people are actually. Uh, getting sick and the, this whole picture is needed now if you only only test uh, the the sick people then then we get a count of the sick people so many affected so many affected but what about the asymptomatic carriers that appears to be the main problem so if uh, i i put up several several questions on the asymptomatic ones that we don't know whether asymptomatic people 
uh, you know, this, these are very important questions. And for this, we need to uh, look at people who are not sick. And this information is very crucial for the future. Uh, Madam, there are requests uh, from the viewers, uh, uh, from some viewers who are students of your subject, uh, and they are requesting, is it possible to get a copy of your presentation? They are interested in uh, that. <laughs> If you think it can be spared, then you may send us a copy. We will forward it to them. Yes, yes. I, I will send you a copy. No problems with that. I'll send. <laughs> okay. Thank I'll, you. Send, I'll send my PowerPoint presentation to you. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, now, one or two last questions. Uh, one is that you were talking about the role of science centers. Uh, let me be a little more specific in that. Uh, that if you have to plan or chalk out a program for the science center, some kind of program, some kind of uh, themes. Do you have anything in mind that you would like the science centers to do right now? Um, see, right now, the overarching thing is this pandemic and future pandemics. Uh, what do we do? Uh, for the science center, what I understand is that you mainly cater to students who are uh, till the graduate level from school onwards and if that is the case then I think we should, they should be told that uh, what were in, in, in history what were the pandemics and what pandemics pandemic we faced now and how the future pandemic can be and they should be educated about uh, some of them should come and do research on that and some of them can you know uh, you can start, some of them can study the history of the pandemics and uh, it's going, this is one theme I would think. And other than that, I would think we should not forget about the climate. That is another uh, issue that uh, is very, very crucial. And sometimes we are not paying enough attention to it. And now we have got diagnosed uh, because of this uh, particular pandemic. So that is, and th there hasn't been enough predictions. But the, the climate changes could cause many of these infections to surface. So uh, the climate change and, and these may be related. So people should study um, uh, study these things and the themes. Then the theme science centers can bring about is how is climate change related to surfacing of uh, infections. Um, that is that is that is a distinct possibility, and one should look at that. And I'm sure there are studies on it that. Climate changes and behavior. I've seen some interesting studies that behavior of uh, the small mammals, the behavior of uh, uh, large mammals, they change with climate change because their habitats are changing. Their you know the 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 pulse of the system is changing. So it will be very um, interesting to study uh, for the science centers to bring out this and sort of give it to these uh, students to look at. And of course, I said biodiversity, we are losing a lot of biodiversity that uh, would, should be a theme of the science centers. So basically, I'm talking about three, three themes. You might appreciate, Madam, that we have already decided from our council to go on for a very all comprehensive uh, uh, exhibition on this uh, pandemic, particularly the uh, genotic diseases and uh, this coronavirus, of course. And uh, initially, since now we have to maintain the social distance and all, uh, so initially it would be on the digital platform and then it would be also transformed to uh, the physical uh, platform. It will be made one permanent exhibition as well. Now, in relation to that, uh, I'd like to request you that uh, may we expect that we can uh, get your help uh, as and when we develop such uh, exhibitions, uh, so for the content and other guidance is concerned. Sure, I would love to do that. Sure. Okay. Okay, madam. And one last question that I would ask you, it is also a very interesting point that uh, uh, I remember that in one interview a few years back, uh, we had with uh, Dr. Porimala Raman of uh, uh, TIFR.